So even though bone and cartilage have a lot in common with each other, one really critical difference is that bone is a very vascular tissue, whereas cartilage is mostly avascular. We'll be talking a lot more about the importance of blood later in the course, but one of the important things to remind you of right now is that being further from the blood supply makes it harder for a tissue to access critical nutrients. Remember, diffusion doesn't work well over a long distance. So one of the consequences of avascularity is that tissues often repair themselves slowly and inefficiently. If anybody watches rugby, um, then you probably notice that many of the players have developed a condition known as cauliflower ear. And that happens because the elastic cartilage in the ear gets damaged repeatedly. And it's damaged so often that it can't repair itself fast enough. So the body starts to make mistakes with repair, it starts to take shortcuts, and the cartilage gets replaced with other types of tissue. And that leads to permanent deformations of the ear. Like cartilage, uh, bone also has two primary models for bone growth. The first is known as intramembranous ossification, and it's actually very similar to appositional cartilage growth, except that that process has to also incorporate developing blood vessels as well. But the reason why I'm back to mentioning bones at this point, after talking about cartilage, is because most of the growth on long bones actually arises from a hyaline cartilage template. And this process is known as endochondral ossification. It's literally the process of making bone from cartilage. So that's what we're looking at here on this slide. On the left side, uh, we have a typical long bone. And again, you can see the shaft or the diaphysis. And at each end, there's the head or the epiphysis. They're labeled pretty clearly. But remember that the region uh, between them is known as the metaphysis, or now we can call it the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate, although that's kind of confusing to use that term. In this region, uh, that's where we find the cartilage. So when the cartilage there becomes ossified, um, that makes it the primary site of bone growth as well. It was a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because it would seem logical that bones would just add on new tissue to the end. But keep in mind that the ends of bones are often articulating with other bones. And so if we were to add to that region, we'd have to be continuously recreating those articulations. It'd be really difficult to do. So growing from within, from the metaphysis, from the growth plate, solves this problem. Now, as you probably know, uh, grown bones don't continue to grow for our entire lives. In fact, for most people, your bones have stopped growing sometime in your teens. And this is because the division of chondrocytes in the metaphysis is hormonally controlled. So as the levels of hormones inside of your body change following puberty, the cartilage cells are no longer going through mitosis. And so that's one of the reasons why forensic experts can actually tell the age of a person just by looking at their skeleton, and specifically um, by looking at a long bone in an x-ray. A younger person who still has chondrocytes going through mitosis will have an epiphyseal plate that you can see quite clearly because cartilage is less dense than bone, and so it shows up a little bit lighter on the x-ray. An older person wouldn't have an epiphyseal plate or metaphysis visible, and instead they'd only have a thin line known as the epiphyseal line instead. That contains the remnants of the chondrocytes. Everything else would have been ossified or converted to bone. In the images at the bottom, uh, if you look closely, you can see both the epiphyseal plate and the epiphyseal line in the metacarpal bones of the hand. We can take a look at this process of endochondral ossific ossification a little bit more closely in the histological view of the growth plate. So just to orient you on this image, the top portion would be the epiphysis and the bottom portion would be the diaphysis. So the mitotically active chondrocytes divide upward, meaning that the newly formed chondrocytes are actually closer to the epiphysis, whereas the older chondrocytes are pushed downward towards the diaphysis. When the older chondrocytes die off, being far from the blood supply, they leave behind their lacuna. And these empty spaces are then invaded by osteoblasts, which will migrate upwards from the diaphysis, the osteoblasts will then start to secrete the hydroxyapatite bone matrix and they'll ossify that tissue. Now, we can also see differences in the growth plate really well in the rightmost image here, um, which is again taken under a microscope. Zone one is closest to the epiphysis and it contains the resting or quiescent cartilage. Zone two is really densely packed because that's where the cells are actively going through mitosis. In zones three and four, we're starting to see the chondrocytes die off. And so there's a lot more space in that region. 
And in zone five, we're actually seeing the invasion by the osteoblasts from the shaft of the bone. And that's the ossification of the tissue. I want to take a quick look at a couple of disorders that highlight some of the important things we've talked about up to this point with connective tissues. Remember that one of the key components of the matrix is the protein collagen. That's because collagen is both strong and flexible. This is particularly important at articulations because we need to be able to provide a range of motion for a joint, but we also need to stabilize the joint to prevent injury. But co collagen is genetically encoded and therefore can have mutations associated with it. One disorder associated with collagen mutations is EDS or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I want to show you a movie quickly of an individual that has EDS. Hey everybody, it's Michael from Beirut. I play as Mifton. And I'm here to show you about all my crazy uh, rubber man syndrome techniques. What's the sound of one hand clapping? Ask yourself that right now. What is the sound of one hand clapping? All right. Whoa. All right. Well, the, everyone keeps asking me, whoa, Michael, how can you do this, man? How can you do that? Well, it's because my hands can go completely flat, as you can see. It's almost like I got no knuckles. You can see that right there. My fingers can go pretty far back. This is a common trick, putting your thumb right across your forearm. Now this is one of the tricks that I find that's usually just purely unique, unique to myself. It's called the pretzel. You start palm to palm, move back to back, go back to palm to palm, and then pull it back up. And for my grand finale, put your arms behind your back, twist up, bring it down, and uh, you're done. Peace out. Now, if you only watched YouTube videos like this one, you'd probably think that EDS is kind of cool because it lets you do all of these things that you saw in the video that most of us could never do. But if you talk to a person with EDS, they would probably talk mostly about pain or about the arthritis that's associated with this condition, especially in the really severe cases because there's a whole spectrum of collagen mutations. This abnormal range of motion often increases the friction at the joint capsule and leads to damage of the tissue in the longer term, so it can actually be very debilitating. I also want you to remember that all connective tissues are defined by the composition of their matrix. To highlight this, I want to talk quickly about a disease known as fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, also known as FOP, or more commonly as stone man's disease. Remember that both bone and cartilage develop from stem cell progenitors, and this differentiation is under the control of hormones. So in the case of bone, the hormones activate a transcription factor known as BMP, or bone morphogenic protein, and that drives the process of ossification. Individuals that have FOP activate that transcription factor in response to injury instead, and that leads to damaged tissues regenerating as bone. So when this disorder was first discovered, people would often go to a surgeon with some kind of bony mass protruding from their body, and like any good surgeon, they would attempt to remove it to help their patient. But the problem is that surgery creates a lot of tissue damage in and of itself, and so months later, the people would then go back to the surgeon with even more bone growth in that same spot, an even bigger protrusion. But because bone is strong and relatively inflexible compared to the tissues that it was replacing, if we deposit it at the wrong locations, it can lead to very severe skeletal deformities, but in many cases, it can lead to death as well.